So welcome in everybody. My name is Jude Grimaldi. I will be your host and moderator this evening. Welcome to the comprehensive planning webinar. This is a topic that is extremely relevant and extremely important. Um, I'm personally really excited about about this webinar today. I think that there's going to have a lot of really great insight. You know, there's a lot of really important pieces to the wealth planning picture and you know touching on each one of those is so incredibly important so i hope today that you'll be able to get some some golden nuggets of of knowledge out of this today from our panel um so just a few housekeeping items if you do have any questions or comments, you can feel free to submit those inside of the chat or the Q&A feature that's at the bottom there. Um, I'll do my best to get other questions answered, um, but if not, we may we may follow up as well. Um, you can always reach out to us offline as well and get in touch with any of the advisors in your area. All right, so we can go ahead and jump in. So as I mentioned, my name is Jude Grimaldi. I'm a member of the practice management team here at Mariner, and I'm joined today by three uh, really incredible panelists. So first we have Michelle Cross. Michelle is a senior wealth advisor in, um, in Sarasota. And then we have Justin Richter. Justin is a, another senior wealth advisor. And then third, we have Chad Hamilton, and Chad is leader of the practice management team here uh, at Mariner as well. So our topic today, comprehensive wealth planning. So as I mentioned, you know, comprehensive planning is planning that touches multiple key areas or all of the key areas of that wealth picture. And, you know, a reason that we are the Mariner Wealth Advisors that we are is because we provide that full picture planning for our clients. And we have those resources available um, for whatever that situation may be, whatever the um, planning strategy may be. You know, I've been in the industry uh, just under 10 years at this point, and I've worked with a lot of different firms. And, you know, I can, I'm being a little biased here, but I can honestly say that Mariner is very unique in the way that they provide their resources to both their advisors and to the clients as well. You know, regardless of what the planning type may be, Mariner has a resource available for you. So, you know, if you are working with an advisor and, you know, you're really primarily focusing on one piece of that picture, um, I just recommend taking a step back and taking a look at that full picture and really thinking about it in, uh, in that comprehensive lens. So that brings me to my first question, and we can start with Chad here. And if you each could just give a quick introduction, you know, before you answer the question here, that would be really helpful. Um, so Chad, why do you find comprehensive planning important? Thanks, Jude. Well, it's good to be here. And, and just real quick, um, I'm a certified financial planner, a chartered advisor in philanthropy. I've been in the industry for 25 years. And, uh, and I, as you mentioned, I lead the practice management department at Mariner. Practice management for us, the main thing that I would say is we want to create an exceptional client experience across the firm. Um, okay, so why is planning important, comprehensive planning? It provides the context for making wise financial decisions. The best analogy is a puzzle, right? It's been used countless times over the years to convey this interdependent nature of good advice. All of the pieces need to fit together like they do with a puzzle. Any changes to your investment allocation impact the amount of income taxes due, which will alter cash flow needs. And that in turn affects your ability to save for retirement, make annual gifts. The point is, the like the pieces of the puzzle, they all need to fit together, right? Effective planning is holistic, and that means it's comprehensive in scope, and all of the components are interdependent. Now, imagine we have a thousand piece puzzle, and all of those pieces are spread out on the table in front of you. What's the single most important piece of the puzzle? And as much as I would love to hear everyone's individual answers, this format is not going to allow for that. So I'll just tell you, it's the picture on the top of the box. See, that's what provides us with an understanding of the scene that we're, we're trying to piece together. So similarly, before you try to go about putting together all the pieces of a financial plan, you need to first start with a really clear vision of what you want to achieve, what your ideal future looks like. So for us at Mariner, the starting point is not um, the tactical steps of financial needs analysis or asset allocation, even though those are important. Instead, the starting point is what we call discovery, and that's just understanding, articulating, clarifying what matters most to each of our clients and, and how to achieve those goals, right? Then, then that provides that picture on the top of the box to then enable us to put together the best plan and move forward. 
that's a really great point. I think that, you know, as you mentioned, that discovery piece is so incredibly important because we can only do so much with the information that we have. So, you know, the more information that we have, the, the more comprehensive the plan can be and the better the plan will be. Awesome. Thanks, Chad. So I will then move over to Michelle. Michelle, I'll ask you the same question um, with a quick introduction. Um, why do you find comprehensive planning important? Um, thanks, Jude. And I don't want to follow Chad. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I'm Michelle Cross. I'm a senior wealth advisor in Sarasota. Um, I am, I guess you could call me a career changer. I spent the first 10 years of my career in public accounting. So I have a CPA. I used to audit mutual funds and hedge funds, decided I was tired of living in the past and wanted to be more proactive and um, planning for clients and how they could make the best decisions um, with the resources that they had. So I have my CPA, I have my CFP, the Certified Financial Planner designation. I also have a CDFA, which is um, the Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. And um, that has allowed me to really kind of specialize in um, people who are in transition. So through divorce, loss of spouse, it's, it's an area that I'm really um, passionate about. So I mean, I guess to answer your question, I think really simply, if you don't know where you're going, how can you be sure you're going to get there? Um, so our lives are just incredibly busy. Every time you turn the TV on um, or listen to the radio, someone's trying to give you advice. And the reality is that there is no one product or solution that is appropriate for everybody. And that's universal. So I think it's really important to understand um, a client's unique situation and their specific goals before you give them any advice. If you don't take the time to do that and understand the big picture, you're really just operating in a silo. And there could be all sorts of unintended consequences with the decisions and recommendations that you're making. And I'll also say that um, there's been a lot of studies that show that if you write down a goal, it's much more likely to, for that goal to be achieved. Um, so allow, writing it down allows you to really focus on what's important and not necessarily the stuff that is, doesn't contribute to reaching the goal. So regularly tracking your progress towards your goals, I think will hold you accountable and it'll also help you make adjustments along the way. That's a really great point. And it's funny that you mentioned that I implemented that probably like two months ago. And I was like, oh, this is a little cliche. I'm never going to follow through with it. But even just seeing seeing those goals every single day on my refrigerator, it, it makes it that much more relevant. It works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. Thanks, Michelle. So Justin, same thing. Um, why do you find comprehensive planning, planning important? Yes, thanks. Um, so Justin Richter, Senior Wealth Advisor in our headquarters of Overland Park, Kansas, uh, also a member of Mariners and Investment Committee, uh, have my CFP designation as well as a Chartered Financial Analyst designation. Um, I find myself in a unique situation coming more, some, more, more so from the investment side uh, of the business at the early part of, of my career. Uh, organizations where investments was the, the primary focus of the client as well as the advisor. Uh, and as time has passed, it, the value that is built in the connection that is created between the client and the advisor when there is a focus on the bigger picture um, being able to find purpose in that client's net worth so it's not necessarily looking at an arbitrary index on how the portfolio is doing but uh, providing how that meets and fits in with the, the goals-based planning that that we're doing uh, that really allows us to based on those goals back into a required return that uh, is going to make those those goals and assumptions possible. Awesome. Thank you. Now, Justin and Michelle, you guys are both active advisors, you know, being senior wealth advisors and having your own book of business that are active right now. Do you and, you know, Justin, I'll start with you as you just uh, finish that question. Do you find that there's any key areas within planning that clients tend to dismiss or they tend to forget that really do have a have a big impact on you know a lot of the other areas of their plan? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in my years, the, the two biggest areas that I see that uh, get neglected or the, where the can gets kicked down the road are estate planning and, and often the insurance planning that, that goes along with that. Uh, no one wants to think about what happens if they die or become incapacitated. Uh, but if those unfortunate events were to transpire, that would be 
the, the most important thing possible that those individuals could think about making sure that their family is taken care of, mm-hmm. uh, how their assets are, are distributed. So that's one area that yeah, nobody likes to think about it, but is extremely important tying back into other areas of, of the plan. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You know, having people tend to think of that as it's, it's a little nerve wracking thinking of that end of life and trying to plan for that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about, you know, your family and your children, and the legacy that you're going to end up providing after the fact. So Michelle, I'll ask you the same question. Do you find that there's any key areas that people tend to dismiss or forget about that have that big impact? Yeah, um, I think a lot of the times um, the hesitation we encounter has to do with tax planning, um, like Roth conversions and tax loss harvesting. I think that people are, you know, um, taught that they should minimize their taxes at all costs. And, you know, certainly the CPA doesn't want to see um, that the tax taxable income is increased. Um, so I just think that active coordination with all of the outside professionals, the CPA, the attorney, I think that's really critical to have us all um, on the same page and understand why we're making the recommendations we're making. Um, having been at a couple of other firms, I have the benefit of um, seeing else, seeing what else is out there and what other tools other firms are using. And I can honestly say that at Mariner, we have the best tools and software and resources available. Um, it really allows us to um, show the client, um, like quantify the value that we're providing and have everyone understand why we're making these recommendations. So is there any specific things that you do to address this with your clients? You know, is there any specific, um, you know, questions that you're asking everybody or, you know, how do you address people that tend to dismiss these things? I would just say that um, let's get an open dialogue with the CPA. Um, you know, I, I understand the hesitation, but if we can show that, you know, specifically with the Roth conversions and um, if you pay, if you spread it out over a couple of years and you pay a little bit of tax now, look at how much it's going to save you later on. Look at how much it's going to save your kids and grandkids, wherever the money's going. Um, so I just think it's um, not being afraid of communicating and being a team player. Right. Right. Definitely. And you mentioned something earlier about, you know, making sure that all of the pieces of the puzzle or all of the players in the game are, are, aligned and everybody's involved in this. And I think that brings up a really great point of, you know, being advisors and planners, we are, we have our hands in a lot of different pots of this wealth picture, the full wealth picture. And so clients look to us for these individual specific strategies, but we're also there to be these guides, you know, we're also there to guide them through and how to address all these situations appropriately and, you know, how to navigate these different conversations. So I think that's something that's really important um, that, you know, everybody should have in their advisors, you know, look to them as a guide for these different things and don't hesitate to ask them questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Judah, I would all step in and, and say, I, to add to that, uh, when I speak to clients and explain what we do, uh, it's essentially we act as a corporate executive team. And in that process, the client's at the top as CEO, and then our job as the advisory team is to fill in the other executive positions around that. Uh, so the chief financial officer making sure cash flows, incomes, budgets are, are correct. Uh, a chief strategy officer looking out over the next three to five years of horizon and, and what things might be coming up uh, that we need to think about or a, a risk officer that's uh, making sure that in any avenue of the plan, the client is is not taking any uh, risk that they're, they probably shouldn't be. Right. That's a great point. So that brings up a question. There's so many different areas of financial planning, you know, investment management, risk management, cash flow, retirement planning. Um, And Chad, I'll ask you this question first. Can you talk a little bit about the relationships between all of these different types of planning and the impacts that, you know, one may have on another later on? Yeah. And and maybe a a way to start is just to play out a, a question that I've heard many times over the years. I've had many people say to me, you know, what, what's my opinion on a particular investment? Is it, is it a good buy? And, 
And I've always said, I can't possibly give good investment advice without knowing about your situation. You can have two people with the same age, identical net worth statements, and drastically different investment portfolios to meet their needs, because so much, much of it has to do with other planning considerations, risk tolerance, time horizon, income needs, estate planning goals, and, and we could go on there. So you have to look at all of these things in the aggregate and say, what is the best solution? And to start to optimize it, you need to really know all of those components, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things we could talk about our capabilities as a firm, and I would say we've got as many resources under one roof as, as anyone. I mean, um, an independent trust company, insurance, corporate retirement plan solutions, investment banking, business valuation. But the thing about it is, um, the, it's not as if we need to serve in all those roles. So we don't have to prepare the client's tax return, although we can, but we have CPAs that do that, that understand what's in there. Just like mm -hmm. we don't have to serve as corporate trustee, but we understand what that role entails. We know everything about it. So, so much of this boils down to intentionality mm -hmm. and knowing that, look, if we, People routinely have estate documents this thick and they don't really know what's in it. Right. And so reviewing the documents and being able to say, here's how your plan works today. Is this how you want it to work? Is this aligned with what you want to have happen? Now, if it is, great. Um, if not, then we can make some changes, but at least it's intentional at that point. And, and there aren't any unintended consequences, as Michelle alluded to, right, that that, you know, those risks that people don't know about, those are the things that we can uncover with having enough expertise in all these areas. Right. No, definitely. That's a great point. And that goes back to, you know, the resources that that Mariner has um, again. And I'm, I feel like I'm plugging this a lot, but it's true. You know, I'm not trying to be biased, but it is something that I've I've learned through experience and I see every day. You know, I work with advisors on a daily basis and there's so many different uh, teams and specializations within just the firm itself that you know we have everything that you need all the ammunition you need in order to to tackle that so uh justin i'll ask you the same question can you talk a little bit about you know some of the relationships that that you see and the impacts that they have on each other absolutely it's similar to, to chad's point um i always tell clients that it, the advice we give is only as good as the information that that we're given mm -hmm. um, so digging through the details of, of each of these areas to determine the the nature of how they're they're related uh, using tax planning as an example and relating it back to the investments uh, how can we be as tax efficient as possible with asset location and holding our more tax efficient assets within a trust or other taxable portfolio and shielding other ordinary income generating assets within IRAs. Um, little things like that, that, that go a long ways into reducing the, the, the tax profile, which of course, uh, no one wants to pay more than they, they absolutely have to. Perfect. Michelle, same thing. Do you, do you have any uh, insights into the, the different relationships and the impacts? Well, Justin got one of mine. Um, it's definitely the <laughs> asset allocation versus asset location conversation. We talk about that a lot. Um, from an estate planning standpoint, um, we are really big on understanding how accounts are titled, who the beneficiaries are, making sure there are beneficiaries, avoiding probate. So a lot of clients come to us with their documents and um, they've got a trust, but there's no statement that shows that the trust has actually ever been funded. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really expensive piece of paper. So we um, we do spend a lot of time just making sure beneficiaries are update, updated so that the assets will pass through um, efficiently in the way that they want them to. Sure. Um, and then I'll say on the cash flow side, um, really understanding how you're tracking towards your goals helps the client make informed cash flow decisions. So for example, you know, do they need to save more? How much can they afford when they're buying a new house? I always tell people that I do not have any intention of being the bu budget police. I don't want to tell you how you spend your money, but I'm just here to educate you about the consequences of the choices that you're making so you can make those best choices for your family. Perfect. Thank you. 
there, we did have a question that came in that I do want to address really quickly. And um, the question's another area that's a blind spot is government impacts. How can that certain uncertainty be addressed? And I think that, you know, that's incredibly relevant, you know, now that we're in the midterm elections and, you know, every few years or so, there's always something that is happening um, that's going to have an impact to this. And, and I can say just as a piece of advice is, you know, keep your finger on the pulse and have a plan. Having that financial plan is the most important piece because, you know, that plan should be addressing these, these uncertainties. You don't really know what's going to happen. You know, nothing is guaranteed ever. And so making sure that you have a plan that is addressing a number of different uncertainties to make sure that it's successful after the fact is going to be, you know, the most important thing. And I'll open this up to any of the three of you, if you have anything additional to add there. Yeah, I think that the more we can be proactive versus reactive is mm -hmm. extremely important. So when we have situations that are political that may lead to changes in taxes or uh, estate planning items, being able to have the experts in house to walk through what the possible outcomes are and ahead of time know how we will react if a given situation uh, unfolds. So. Uh, we don't want to be last minute trying to scramble to determine how we react. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I was just going to say, let's try to shift the focus and, and only worry about the stuff we can control mm -hmm. and not worry about the stuff that we can't control. But I think Justin did a really good job of explaining, you know, okay, with all this uncertainty, let's try to figure out which direction, what are the possible uh, ways that this is going to turn out. And if it goes one way, we're going to do this. If it goes another way, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. So building flexible plans, I think is really important. And at risk of really prolonging an answer to a, a pretty simple question, that's a good one. I, I think this this piece about control is really interesting. So I like to think about planning in light of the amount of control that we have. There's, there's three aspects, right? So first are the things that you have total control over. Factors like investment allocation, discretionary expenses, you can fully adjust those kinds of things. Then the, there's the second category, things that you have some ability to control, like amount of income taxes paid, the amount of assets you have liquid and readily available. You can't completely control those things, but you, you definitely have some opportunities to make changes. And then the last are those things or events you have no control over. Mm -hmm. Legislative changes, macroeconomic moves, what the Fed does with interest rates, I don't know, global pandemics, right? Like we're all very familiar with these kinds of things. Um, and they have a big impact, but we have no ability to influence them. So what do you do about that? And I think the first thing is you make the most of the things you can control, right? Evaluate factors. Where can you move the needle to improve uh, the strength of the plan? And then evaluate the things that are somewhat or completely out of your control and build a plan that can withstand all of those contingencies. Mm -hmm. Like we like to model different what ifs and build plans that incorporate a buffer or a shock absorber so that you can withstand negative contingencies like we saw in the market downturn in March of 2020 um, or even earlier this year, right, where we would say we can't predict the future, but we can prepare for it with a good plan where that buffer is already built in. And it's it, there's a lot of peace of mind there when when we can do that proactively. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a, you know, that brings up a point, you know, there's so many things that are happening right now in the current market climate and, you know, even just with COVID. So thinking about the, the recent current events and the climate of the market and, you know, recent changes to inflation, I'll ask, you know, we'll start off with, uh, let's start with Justin. So have you had to change your approach to the plans that you are working on with your clients because of all these recent events? Uh in, in certain ways, yes. Uh, I think in these periods of stress, we first and foremost want to remind our clients that the current environment that we're going through isn't necessarily going to be representative of the full time horizon of the plan, which in many cases is 20, 30, 40 plus years. Uh, so we don't want to let that, that recent bias, recency bias um, 
over impact what we're doing on the, on the planning, uh, but it does allow us to be able to alleviate certain fears by utilizing our our software and doing scenario analysis mm -hmm. um, to be able to look as inflation is extremely top of mind and rather looking at base case of two and a half percent inflation for the life of the plan. What do things look like if that's three percent? If that's four percent? Uh, how is that going to impact the spending that occurs in retirement that's going to be dramatically impacted by that, that growth of inflation? Um, and in many cases, there are levers we can pull, adjustments that we can make in order to offset that. Um, but again, most everything we see is cyclical. And even though that cycle may not feel great right now, uh, it always comes back around. Definitely. Michelle, you know, I'll, I'll throw that one at you as well. You know, with everything that's happening, have you had to change your approach or do you have any, any insights there? Yeah, I would say that um, overall, I haven't changed the approach. We still focus on planning. We still focus mm -hmm. on the long term, but the reality is that we have not had a lot of volatility in the markets coming out of since coming out of the great recession right 2008 2009 people forgot what volatility was like and now that it's back it's like kind of like when you're having a baby like you forget all the pain <laughs> of what you went through and it just feels brand new and like no one's ever done this before um so i'm gonna share my screen really quickly um and hopefully you guys can all see this um yeah. move us move our pictures out of the way here. But um, I use this a lot in client meetings lately. Um, this is a chart that I know you probably can't read everything, but just visually, you see the 0% the across, um, across the screen. And each year going back to 1980 has a bar. Each year also has a red dot, okay? So if you just look at this, Everything above the line is a positive return, and there's a lot more bars above the line than below the line. So what that means on a calendar basis, in the last 42 years, 32 years were positive. Um, but within that, even if we had a really good year, there were ne negative points during the year. And so um, at one point, you know, this year, what is this, probably like 1998, um, the markets ended up up over 27%, but at one point they were down 19%. And so if people are in the weeds at that 19% thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to stomach this. I got to get out. I got to get out. Then, you know, they sell and they've lost all of these gains. Um, so that's, that's something that I think I'm a visual person, as maybe you can tell. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to use charts like this. And I'll um, I'll show you this other one, too, that I really like. You're certainly not going to be able to read this. Um, but this is what I call the quilt chart. And it is um, every box, it represents a different part of the market. And it's a different color. And so you see, going back to 2007, you know, what do you what do you notice? The reason why I call it a quilt chart is because the colors are all over the place. They're never, you know, you're you're going to have emerging markets um, equities that top performer in one year, and then you know they they drop to the bottom the year after. So um, we, what I try to do is really focus on diversification. So this line where where everything is um, connected, asset allocation, that is a diversified portfolio. You're never going to be at the top. You're never going to be at the bottom, um, but long term, you're going to do pretty well switch back here. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments while I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a, a few things as it relates to the, the opportunities that are created at, at any time in a given market. So as, as Michelle said, more often than not, the, the market is positive, uh, but there are going to be fluctuations and how we react to those fluctuations uh, are extremely impactful to the, to the plan. Um, if we make a wrong decision and turn a paper loss into a permanent loss, uh, that can very significantly distort the outcome of the long term of the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, market timing is extremely tough on when you're getting in, when you're getting out, and almost nobody gets it right, even the, the best professionals. 
so that's something to be very careful with and make sure that we're trying to keep the emotion out of our decisions as much as possible. Uh, it's a hard thing to do, but that's our jobs as advisor and advisors in order to, to do that. But again, each of these drops, uh, when you look at uh, 2020 as an example, going through the heat of COVID and in a very immediate 34% decline in the S&P 500, um, rather than being fearful of, of those periods, we want to look at how we can be opportunistic, whether it is in some ways on the asset allocation, swapping some of our low risk assets into higher risk assets that have been beaten down in valuation, uh, or looking at it from a planning perspective of, say, uh, estate planning. And if we're looking at um, what is currently a $12 million lifetime exemption, which is a lot, uh, and it's going to go down at some point in time. But if somebody end of or at beginning of that year prior to COVID was thinking about making a, a lifetime gift to use that exemption, uh, and then all of a sudden you have that 34% decline, uh, it does provide an opportunity to, instead of that same $12 million, make a larger gift to family and other trust type of arrangements that be, would be equivalent to 16 million of assets prior to, to COVID. So being able to look opportunistic is uh, definitely helpful. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and I would say to, to add on to, to Justin's point about market timing and why it's so futile, I, I want to dig into that just a little bit. So then like, why is that so hard to do? And it comes down to this fact that with the bear market or a big market correction, like we experienced earlier this year, it's like pushing a beach ball underwater. And when, when it starts to reemerge, when the market starts to come back around, it doesn't just gradually drift upward. It pops back out of the water. The bottom of the market's uh, not determined by extensive analysis. It's more of this feeling that, that sets in. And uh, when it, it happens, usually when the news is still bad, that's when the recovery gets well underway. The headlines are still gloomy and pessimistic and the market's already made a big positive move. I remember um, a specific day early in, in at the beginning of COVID in March 26th, it was the, the exact day of 2020. We learned that there were 3.3 million people that filed for unemployment benefits in one week. At the time, that was five times more than any other previous record ever recorded. And what did the market do? On the same day that we got by far the worst economic unemployment news ever, the market, uh, both the S&P and the Dow were up 6%. So these things happen at the same time terrible economic news and incredible market returns at the same time. And, and what's happening? Well, the market moves ahead of the overall economy. That's what Warren Buffett meant you know, in October of 08. He said, if you wait for the Robins, spring will be over. In other words, if you sit on the sidelines until news improves, you generally will miss most of the rebound. And so that's just kind of the utility of market timing is, is that whole idea. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And there's so many things, especially nowadays, there's so many different things that are happening in the world. And, you know, I asked you, I, Justin and Michelle, I asked you both this earlier, but I'll open this to the three of you. You know, I asked if you change the way that you approach planning. Now, with everything that's happening and, you know, the recent climate and um, have you noticed the way the shift, have you noticed the shift in the way that clients are approaching planning? And Justin, we can start with you. Yeah, I, I'd say whenever there is a challenging market environment, focus tends to hone in on short-term investment performance. Yeah. So even though the plan and the longer-term goals are, are what matters, when things don't feel good, that's where the, the pain point is and, and mm -hmm. where focus ends up being. Um, but again, it's coming back to how is it impacting the plan? Is the, the overall plan still successful? Uh, even with some of the challenges that we're going through. And I think that is, is really the, the, the primary driver to make sure that we stay on course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Justin's right in that their clients are tending just to be very focused on what's happening in their accounts right now and what, is, what does this mean? And we bring it back to that big picture 
this plan, you know, all these Monte Carlo scenarios that we're running, they factor in way worse returns than what we what we're experiencing now. Um, and your plan still works. And so if if you had continuous negative declines for years, okay, yes, then I think we might need to make some changes and here's how we would do it. Um, but the the plans that we're building are factoring in really bad returns. Um, and and just to, to again, bring it back to that longer term, bigger picture and that they're gonna be okay. A um, lot of talk about cash reserve, having enough set aside um, that you don't have to worry about pulling money out of your accounts when they're down. Um, that's something we we talk about in good times and bad. Um, but now it's really making sense of why why we're we're uh, recommending that. Definitely. One thing that I will mention on this topic is, you know, last month um, we had Mariner's own Jeff Crumpleman and uh, Chief Investment Officer Katrina Radenberg did our 2022 mid-year crystal ball outlook where they really focus on the market and the economy and looking into the future and what, um, you know, what we're expecting to happen. So if you haven't seen that yet, I would recommend, I'll just share my screen really quickly, um, but you can jump into our Mariner website. You can just search Mariner webinars. And we have all of our previous webinars are recorded, but that 2022 crystal year ball outlook is, is right here. So I would definitely recommend jumping in if you haven't seen that. It's, it was a really great session. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree. And, and also point to that how uh, Jeff Krumpelman and Katrina Radenberg would lead that session, uh, do a really good job of analyzing the data. Um, so much of what we see from the, the media, that's real-time media constantly at, uh, at our fingertips, uh, tends to be sensationalized and mm -hmm. puts us in a situation where we tend to have what I would consider an overact overreactive society. So looking back through that data, we can see through the, the headlines to actually understand what's going on. But kind of to that overreactive point, um, just as an example, looking back to, to May and June when uh, things were feeling their worst uh, during the second quarter, uh, data points for consumer and small business sentiment were the worst readings that have ever been recorded. Uh, and to put in perspective what we're going through right now to have those data points be worse than they were in the Great Recession of 08-09, uh, worse than they were in the skyrocketing inflation environments of the 70s. And I think if we step back, we can all uh, agree that uh, our situation isn't necessarily as scary uh, as, as what those time periods were. So sometimes we have to uh, manage the emotions, step off the ledge, and uh, look at uh, the underlying data in more mm -hmm. detail. Definitely. That's a really great point. So thinking about the different pieces of comprehensive planning, you know, we've been focusing a lot on investments here, which, you know, from a client's perspective is one of the, one of, if not the most important piece of their plan. But, you know, what I think is probably one of the biggest pieces is retirement planning. You know, people are, get retirement plans right out of college at their first, you know, their first job, first career, they're opening up some sort of retirement plan. Um, so it is, it's super relevant, even from a young age. For somebody that is approaching retirement or recently retired, do you have any pieces of advice for things that they should be considering that they might not be? And I'll um, start. Michelle, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just- No, 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 it's perfect. <laughs> um, I, I think that don't waste the low income tax years when you retire. Um, if Assuming you're retiring before age 72, RMDs from your pre-tax accounts start at 72 now. It used to be 70 and a half. And so um, mo a lot of our clients have built up these huge 401ks over their careers. And it's essentially like a ticking time bomb for uh, tax purposes, because at 72, you know, all of this money has been tax deferred. And at 72, you have to start pulling it out. Now, if you've got other resources and you don't need all of that RMD, um, the required minimum distribution, taking advantage of those early years when you retire where your tax your taxable income is much lower, you can fill up the tax bracket by doing the Roth conversions and that will lower your RMD later. Um, and getting the money out, like I said before, getting money into a Roth is 
going to lower your own taxes over your lifetime, possibly, um, but also um, for the next generation. You know, if you're if you're intending on um, leaving that asset to your children and they're in a high tax bracket. Um, I don't know if, if if all of our participants are aware, but inherited IRAs now have to be withdrawn over 10 years. Um, you can't do it over your lifetime anymore. And so that's going to be a huge, a lot more money is going to end up going to taxes if you leave that to those high income children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add on um, to what Michelle's saying there. You know, it's, it's pretty common misunderstanding as far as how taxes operate in retirement versus pre-retirement, you know, prior to retiring, most people, not everyone, but most people don't have a whole lot of control over it. They can uh, make contributions to 401k plans, make some charitable contributions, like there are some deductions available, but for the most part, the income that they earn just fills up the marginal brackets and, and it is what it is. But then in retirement, when you're living off of assets, there's these different buckets of money and they have different tax treatments. So some things like retirement distributions are fully taxable. Other aspects of cash flow like muni bond income or withdrawals from uh, Roth IRAs are tax-free. And then there are tax-favored uh, sources of income like qualified dividends and uh, and that sort of thing. So what you can do is turn on and off these different buckets of money in order to max out lower brackets without creeping into the higher brackets. And uh, and bringing some intentionality to that can, can save a lot of money in taxes over, over a long period of time. Um, and then the uh, just one other thing I would say to your question about approaching retirement is on the risk side. Mm -hmm. If Prior to retirement, when you're accumulating wealth, volatility is actually not a bad thing. It might not feel good, but the more volatile markets are, you actually, if you're adding money over time or dollar cost averaging, as it's called, you're actually buying more shares when the market's low. So, so that it doesn't harm you, but in, in average rates of return are fine. But when you're in retirement, when you're in the distribution phase, living off of a portfolio, volatility is not your friend, right? It's um, it, how you earn returns matters a great deal. And if you're drawing down from the portfolio at the same time the market's down, that can really exacerbate um, your ability to outlive your money. So, so that we call it sequence of returns risk, but it's basically the need to really look at volatility um, and try to minimize that while still reaching your goals that becomes more important in retirement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think one way to help alleviate those issues is making sure as retirement is about to start or is starting, uh, have plenty of liquid, low volatility assets within the allocation. Uh, the kind of rough rule of thumb is about two years worth of what would be expected to be distributions from the portfolio uh, in something that is not going to go down when the market goes down or not go down as much so that ultimately you can feel comfortable that that capital is there and will last that two-year period. Likely any market environment will have come and gone during that environment and it, it avoids having to to sell a given asset at the, at the wrong time. Perfect. Thank you all. I think that's that's really insightful over everything and it you know it makes me think about you know timing timing of everything um it's so important as pieces of a plan so thinking about timing and thinking about where we are now we're eight months almost nine months into 2022 only have a couple months left do you have any pieces of advice um you know at this point in time and justin we can start with you uh so you know going back to the market volatility we we've, we've had um, most people focus on the concept of tax loss harvesting at the very end of the year as we're getting into December. Um, but while we're having ongoing uh, market volatility, it's a great, oppor great opportunity to step in, make some adjustments in the portfolio. If a given asset is down 10, 15%, to be able to sell it, harvest that loss, replace that asset with another, and then be able to offset potential gains, whether it's this year or, or in future years. 
so that's definitely one area where I, I, I think there's always opportunity in uh, these types of volatile markets. Perfect, Michelle, I'll, I'll throw that one at you as well. Okay, um, I would be looking at cash flow management. You know, how much do you need for the rest of the year? Um, have you taken, are you RMD age and have you taken the RMD yet? Um, as you know, it has to be done before December 31st. If, if you don't need that for living expenses um, and you're charitably inclined, maybe clients can look at doing a QCD, which stands for Qualified Charitable Distribution. Mm -hmm. So you can, um, if you are RMD age, you can actually elect to distribute up to 100,000 of your RMD directly from your investment account to a 501c3 charity. And as um, my parents like to say, uh, I'm not a charity, so it has to be a 501c3. The kids are not considered charity for this, um, nor is a donor advised fund for that matter. But um, it's a great opportunity to make that charitable gift and not have to include that um, amount in your income for tax purposes. Awesome. And Chad, anything from your end? Uh, maybe the big thing, it's a contrarian point, right? But we, we were talking about the, the media the news cycle and how much it feeds off of fear and bad news. If you know where to look for it, there's good news in this. Um, you know, there are strategies that benefit from higher interest rates and the type of environment we're in. So on an advanced planning front, if you have a vacation home and, and you are concerned about estate taxes either now or in the future, this is a really good time with higher interest rates to gift a vacation home to a residence trust. It's called a QPER, um, Qualified Personal Residence Trust, but you can get that out of your estate at a discounted rate, utilize some of your estate tax exclusion, and then all, it's out of your estate as well as all of the future growth on that home. So that can make a big impact, and but it doesn't need to affect your ability to, to live off of a portfolio and meet your goals, right? So mm -hmm. just those kinds of things, charitable trusts, same thing where the higher interest rate environment can actually make those more attractive. So, and then just to tag on to what Justin had said, tax loss harvesting, these are the types of things that we look for where we say, yeah, we know there's a lot of negative headlines, but, but even within that, there's some silver linings. and we want to be proactive in trying to figure out what those are and when they're applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's perfect. And, you know, if you are asking yourself these questions or you don't even know what, what questions to ask yourself, this, it's a, it is a really great opportunity, you know, going back to what I mentioned earlier is that your advisor's there to be a guide. So if you don't know what questions to ask, tell them that, you know, they'll be able to bring these things up and, you know, ask them about the timing of a consideration thing that, things that you should be considering during this time of the year or at any certain point within, you know, your wealth planning roadmap. So I guess the last thing that I'll ask for everybody and I'm, and I'm, I'm adding this in there is, do you have any just final pieces of information, any, any golden nuggets or any closing thoughts that you'd like to provide, whether it's, you know, about the recent market or about comprehensive planning in general? Um, I'll say that I think a lot of the focus has been on the markets and on the performance of the accounts, and that's where the focus um, has been. And maybe clients who are listening to this are remembering, oh yeah, the plan matters and, and it's important. And we wanna make sure that we have enough time to address the plan in the review meetings. Um, if your advisor is not, if you're not finding time to talk about all of it, um, definitely just reach out and say, hey, can we have a planning check-in and you know, see, I heard some of the strategies that you guys were talking about on the webinar, really like to know how this applies to me and if it does apply. Because like I said, in the very beginning, there's not a one size fits all strategy or solution. Um, there's not one product that's appropriate for everybody. And there's not one that's not appropriate for everybody. Right. It's definitely individualized. Um, so just bring it up to your advisor. Definitely. Everything, every individual is different and every plan is going to be different. You know, there's strategies that apply to everybody, but they're, or that apply to a lot of people, but nothing's going to apply across the board. Yeah. yeah and I, I would say that communication is extremely key. Uh, when something does pop top of mind, don't wait for the next meeting to reach out and discuss that with the advisor. 
send an email, make a phone call, engage in that discussion so that something isn't forgotten about since that, that can tend to happen. I would just say uh, so, some of the most important things are, you know, the problems we're not aware of, all of us. So to have specialists look at a truly comprehensive planning will uncover problems that you may not be aware of, spot opportunities you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And so that's so much of the value of what we're talking about today in, in true comprehensive planning is being able to identify proactively any of those needs and opportunities that maybe maybe you don't know about that are just lurking in, in your estate documents or tax return and, and being able to, to find those things. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I'll reiterate that as well. Make sure that you are being as proactive as possible and not reactive. And that is the most important reason. And, and it is the reason that we're talking about comprehensive planning today is to help you realize that there are things that you might not be able to see. And, you know, in order to to address these these hidden opportunities or these hidden strategies, you know, you need to make sure that you have a comprehensive plan. Awesome. Well, thank the three of you um, so much for joining us today. For everybody that is online still, we will have a recording of this webinar available on our website. So Mariner Wealth Advisors slash live webinars. Um, but I hope that you all have learned something today. You know, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us here at Mariner. Um, we're always happy to help, you know, whatever you may need. And, you know, Michelle, Justin, Chad, thank you all so much for the time today. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure, thank you. Have a great evening and enjoy your weekend.